episode number 87 of the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. Welcome to the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. I'm Michelle, a fertility acupuncturist here to provide you with resources on how to create a wholesome approach to your fertility journey. My guest today is Zara Haji. Zara has been a guest on my podcast before, and if you want to go back and find out more about her and her background, that can be found on episode 41. Zara created the first online fertility yoga and meditation program, which is practiced by women in over 25 countries. The Moon Goddess Cycle Harmonizing Fertility Enhancing Practice has helped over 50% of her clients conceive. Zara is also a registered psychotherapist and women's reproductive health and fertility coach, helping women address the often left out psychological and emotional aspects of infertility. Welcome back to the podcast, Zara. Thanks so much, Michelle. So, um, so it's been a little while. <clears throat> um, just so everybody knows, you've been on episode 41. So if anybody wants to get a better background, I don't want to have you like go through the whole explanation sure. of, of your background. So if anybody wants to go back and check that out, it's episode 41. Um, and what have you been working on since? Well, I mean, as you know, we're in like very interesting times. So recently, uh, the conversation that I've been focusing on is the contradictions of trying to conceive during the pandemic, during the coronavirus, and just looking at what's happening for women who are on the fertility journey and what it's like, the emotional and... Um, mental and psychological impact of these times because for so many women cycles have been um, canceled or put on hold so treatments like IUI, IVF, obviously anything that you'd be doing at the clinic like cycle monitoring, all of that has been put on hold and for women on the fertility journey time is already a pressure. Right. So there you know, as women who've been trying to conceive potentially for months or even years, um, you're already no stranger to the passage of time and the feeling mm -hmm. of time running out. And so now in this situation where we actually don't even have a timeline, uh, we don't know when, you know, isolation is going to be lifted. We don't know when people will be able to go back to work as normal. And so there's this suspension of time that's currently happening. And for some women that is creating a lot more anxiety. Mm -hmm. And for some women, the contradiction is, you know, all of a sudden we have all this other time that we didn't have before, mm -hmm. right? So we can't, we can't go out, we can't like, go shopping, can't get your nails done, uh, you can't go get your hair done. Like there is nothing to do outside really of going for a walk or staying home. Right, right. And so now all of a sudden this abundance of time in this weird way has opened up. So part of the conversation I'm having right now with the Yoga Goddess community is looking at these contradictions. So what do you do now that yes for sure there's that feeling of times ticking and your biological clock is ticking and you know there's that sense of like what where are we going now what what can we do but there's also this sense of expansiveness and spaciousness mm -hmm. so it's been really interesting to talk to different women in my own community and hear from some women you know now I feel like I can kind of take a break from this whole trying to conceive um, and actually feel kind of relaxed and at ease. Right. So that was surprising for me because, you know, as, as a woman who has sort of put that journey um, behind me personally, um, 
I'm actually feeling, and I don't know about you, maybe are in a similar situation. I'm definitely feeling that sense of timelessness, like mm-hmm. there's this expansive spaciousness. Yes. It's funny that you say expansive. I had a meeting. It was uh, actually somebody I know who's, who works with a lot of women in business, and she had a, a Zoom meeting that she was offering in service because she felt like a calling to serve at this time. And it was free. And I said, oh, you know, I really like her. So I would love to hop on. And she said, give me a word to everybody that was on. What word comes up to you, like in your mind? We listened to a song, we closed our eyes, we kind of got into a little meditation. She said, what word comes up for you? And my word was expansiveness. (laughs) Yeah, so you can relate to that feeling of yeah. like we're we're in this place of not running around. You don't have to say no to a bunch of commitments. And you know, sorry, I'm just gonna <laughs> wait, oh, no wait. worries. <laughs> <laughs> um there's this, you know, if we continue with these idea of the contradictions, right? So what are you gonna do with this time now that's opened up? Mm-hmm. right there's there's some choices to be made so we can spend a lot of time watching the statistics and how many people have died from covid and how many new cases and kind of really create an additional layer, layer of stress and another thing that's really interesting right. you know women who are on the fertility journey already feel like 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 the control of their lives has been taken away from them yeah, it's it's such an unknown feeling. It's just, you know, the fear of the unknown and not really knowing. So yeah, you have, you feel helpless. And interestingly enough, the same thing is happening right now. And this, this is going to air a little later. So hopefully by then this will be a memory, but it is something to really learn from for sure. You know, mm-hmm. it's an interesting thing, but a lot of the world is now feeling what fertility people on their fertility journey are always feeling exactly exactly yeah so there's this sense of suspension of of time but also that sense of um you know what do we the choices that we make so sometimes it feels like we've been choices have been taken away from us Mm -hmm. And there's this sense of, like, obviously no one chose uh, to be on a fertility journey. It's Mm -hmm. not anyone's first choice. Everyone expects that we'll get pregnant quickly and it'll happen easily. And and sometimes it feels like a cruel joke that everyone around us is getting pregnant without even trying. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, this sense of like injustice and unfairness. And interestingly enough, similarly to this situation, there's this sense of, you know, lack of control and nobody chose the pandemic, you know, to happen. And the consequences of that, again, we're still not sure of. It's an unknown. Right. So how do we navigate these kinds of uncertain waters? And I feel like that's a really important conversation as well, because as women on the fertility journey, we are kind of experts in navigating uncertainty. And so there's also some skills in that to be in the unknown and to not know what's coming next. Mm -hmm. Um, And to do, and and so how do you It's like a practice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a surrender in that. Right. And, um, And so how do you use all of these skills that you didn't choose to have to cultivate, but as, as someone who's on the journey, it's almost like you're forced into um, what I feel like is an initiation, mm-hmm. you know, of like really advanced spiritual concepts right. that like, right. surrender that is forced upon you. Yeah. And it's interesting that it's forced upon us, really, like just even as as the global community, this whole thing is is forced upon us. I feel like we're kind of feeling, like we said, what 
fertility people, you know, people on their fertility journeys are always feeling. But it, what's interesting is, is that we're not going to surrender if it's not forced on us. That's, that's the thing. Yes, exactly. And so part of, um, you know, what I truly believe, Michelle, is infertility is a wake-up call mm -hmm. from the divine feminine. And so um, as women who are waking up through this very painful journey, it's, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to make it sound like it's uh, some kind of romantic idea. It's not. Um, it's a really painful kind of initiation, mm -hmm. but it's a strong feeling that I have from being and doing this work since, uh, you know, 2008 is when I first became in intrigued by women's menstrual cycles and their connection to the lunar cycles and how as women, we actually cycle through four different energies, um, that are I call the goddess energies. So, and that's in sync with our menstrual cycles. Mm -hmm. So, to have never heard of that information until you know my thirties, I really felt like, wow, we're at such a disadvantage when we don't even know the the broader perspective of our feminine energy and ourselves as women. That for most women. Their, their only education, sex education was given in grade seven and grade eight. Mm -hmm. You're given, you know, a pill pack and told don't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you embark on the fertility journey that you even start to learn about ovulation mm -hmm. and the window of fertility that it's only like 24 hours right. that you can actually conceive. And there's all these things that women are completely in the dark about, about their own bodies and the way they work. Mm -hmm. And so I truly believe that the, the, this wake up call is meant to really like, I, 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 from my own experience with my clients, any one of them would say if they had gotten pregnant just at the beginning, like they expected, Mm -hmm. who they are as mothers would have been entirely different. Yeah. I hear that all the time as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so empowering for people to listen to, especially if they're just finding this podcast or just starting their fertility journey. And usually typically what happens in the beginning is that's really one of the darkest times is when you're first realizing it's like this, it, you almost feel like this horrible diagnosis and having to deal with that and not knowing and being confused and you really feel the most lonely and confused um, throughout the whole journey. But I find the same story over and over again, not only with my patients, but with the guests that I have come on, because a lot of people end up doing something with a fertility journey. Like they do something for a living that has to do with helping other women because they've gone through it. And they all say, I wouldn't have changed one thing after the fact. Yeah, exactly. So like, you know, hindsight is always like 2020 that way. Um, but it's a excruciatingly painful experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know this, but studies have shown that a diagnosis of infertility mm -hmm. has the same emotional impact as a diagnosis of cancer. Yes, yes. And that it's very, um, it, it causes PTSD. Yeah, it's, it can be very... Even after people overcome it, they still have PTSD symptoms. It, yes, that is it, in some cases definitely true, especially if you've had recurrent loss or years of, uh, you know, trying cycle after cycle, especially with IVF, that's not that the embryo, either embryos don't make it or uh, embryos are implanted in the uterus and again, they don't, uh, they don't implant, so they're transferred, but they don't implant. And so years like that can definitely create um, a trauma, mm -hmm. a trauma experience for a patient. Um, and tr it is a traumatic experience to have this biological drive that you, you can't seem to, to reach. And 
at the same time, it provides such an opportunity for healing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so you true. talk about aloneness, for example. Right. It's such an interesting, um, just double side of, of yeah. really how you can approach it. You know, and the same thing with what's happening right now. And it's interesting because the universe is so holographic. It really comes down to the yin and yang. There's the yin and yang you can find in everything. And so you can find those two polar opposite ways of looking at everything. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful point that I'd love to linger on a little bit. Because we seem to forget that yin and yang uh, darkness and light Mm -hmm. and you know every day like the day is followed by the night um so there's it just in our daily life we are constantly cycling through darkness and light Mm -hmm. darkness and light right and in our menstrual cycles the same is true we have the luteal and the menstrual phases which Mm -hmm. is the dark phases and then we have the follicular and the ovulatory phases which are are the light phases Mm -hmm. So when estrogen starts to climb in the body, a woman's whole uh, perspective really starts to lighten and brighten. Often when you're on the fertility journey, there's this renewed sense of hope and positive expectation. Yeah. So when we come back to how a woman's body mirrors or the cycle mirrors the phases of the moon, we have like the crescent moon and the full moon. There's this... Mm -hmm you know, expectation and increasing energy, yeah. like bring it's time. Like momentum. Yeah, exactly. There's a momentum. There's also like this new birth, like the, the earth is coming alive again. You know, if you live somewhere with four seasons, you can really see that. Mm-hmm. And then there's a natural withdrawal, you know, like right. the leaves fall off the trees, things become darker, people become more inward, more retreated. And that's similar to premenstruation, where a woman's nature is to draw inwards and to retreat and be more solitary, especially menstruation. Like winter, you kind of just want to hide under the covers and, mm-hmm. you know, be alone and not have anyone bother you. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we're constantly in this cycle, this flow of the feminine through our own menstrual cycles. And I feel like, as, like you said, the yin and the yang. It's about how you are, like uh, your perspective and how you are experiencing Mm -hmm. what's happening in your life. And there's always a way to uh, experience it from a more expansive place. And so I talk about like embracing all four phases of your cycle and not just hyper focusing on ovulation and then, you know, hyper focusing on the disappointment and failure of menstruation. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't get pregnant. So how do we start to look at the whole, the cycle as a whole and embrace all of our, our goddess energies, all of our feminine, you know, experience. Right. And, and I'm having a visual of this push and pull because ultimately this push and pull is what keeps us in suffering. And it's like being on the outer band, bands of the yin and yang. We're just going whew, back and forth. It's almost like you, you see a, a hurricane and the center is where it's still. And the center is like the neutral mind. And the push is resistance mm. to what is. The pull is really desperately wanting something that you don't have. And it's like this back and forth and back and forth. And then when you just allow that to be, you can get to that center place where it's quiet. That's where you'll start to feel peace. Not only do you feel peace, I feel like that place is where you allow everything to settle in your life and move and and also rely on the universal intelligence that wants to help us out. It wants to help us out, but we get in the way, you know? So it's, and it's a tricky thing because of course we get in the way. It's very valid to get in the way because you're going through something that is so difficult and excruciating and difficult, you know? So it's kind of like, it's a tough thing to get to that center, but ultimately really the center is where we're going to get the most peace. Yeah. And I think that's where we come back to that wake up call. The journey is pushing us towards finding that center. 
finding that inner balance that nobody's going to give you from the outside. Mm -hmm. And it's when we reach that place in ourselves of peace and surrender and surrender is not giving up. I want to be really clear. Yeah. You know, surrendering to what wants to happen, what needs to happen, you know, what that transformation that is being asked to happen on your behalf even. I think to myself, surrender is like trust and surrender is almost like listening, being in a place of listening. Like, what are you telling me? Yeah. Yeah. And receiving that, which Mm -hmm. is very much the feminine and the push and pull is very much the masculine. Mm -hmm. Um, And when we just allow ourselves to receive that universal intelligence, like you said, is ready to rush in. Mm-hmm. And, and show us and guide us and give us the way forward. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think to myself, I get a visual of like a wave with what's happening. We've had a tsunami of craziness and madness in life. And it's the noise was so loud. Well, speaking of noise, I have gardeners outside, so I apologize about the background noise, but um, the noise was so loud and there was constant distraction. And now all of a sudden we go from this tsunami to this receding and it's a forced receding and we're going inward. We're forced to, and we're forced to also listen to ourselves and pay attention to the silence, Mm -hmm. which is uncomfortable for a lot of people. And what I notice is people who do well with this, and including my fertility patients, are ones who have had a yoga and meditation practice or some type of practice in the past where they were comfortable with listening to their silence. Yeah. And those are the people that seem to be adjusting the best, the easiest, with yeah. less suffering versus people who have gotten used to the noise. Yeah. And it's just an interesting thing. And it's not a one person versus another person kind of comment. It really comes down to one habit versus one habit. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have to say, um, I've, I've had the good fortune of seeing the same thing amongst my students and clients. So as the yoga goddess <laughs> uh, and, you know, having a practice, a specific practice for fertility, yoga and meditation, the moon goddess um, fertility yoga practice. It's amazing to see like some women who, you know, haven't been in my, um, in my circle are like reappearing from like two, three years ago saying, I have time now. So I want to come back to my practice. Mm -hmm. I know some women come back for their second pregnancy. There's all kinds of reasons why women, um, actually come back to the practice. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's, what's amazing is when you can relax into that space of connecting with self, even when a woman writes to me after, you know, years of trying and not succeeding and then, you know, spending a few months with the the moon goddess practice and then getting pregnant, the first thing she always says is first it brought me back to myself. Mm -hmm. It was that coming back to because you feel like you lose yourself in the first yeah. Journey, yeah. right? Like you lose contact with that person who you used to be. Right. Um, because there's this hyper focus on this goal. Mm-hmm. And so the first, fe- first place I think of healing is that return to self and feeling like you're coming back into connection with the essence of who you truly are. Yeah. And then in that, in that space of healing, it's often very much the case where we become, you know, we become pregnant um, because we're in that receptive place. Right. That's amazing. And, and if you think about the egg, it's very receptive. It's very yin. It allows yeah. by staying stable. If it was moving around, trying to push around, and it wouldn't fertilize. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, there's this real embracing that happens, both at an energetic level, but also literally the egg envelops the sperm. Right, right, totally. That's amazing. That's a a cool perception, perspective. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, um, what have you found to be the biggest resistance among your students with what's happening right now? It's a great question. Um, I mean, the, the fear is for some people really unmanageable. Um, most of my community, I feel like in some ways has an elevated experience, like an elevated perspective mm -hmm. and is really seeing this time as an opportunity, which I find beautiful. Yeah. Uh, which is why I didn't focus on, you know, the panic and the stress of the pandemic, but the contradictions, because there really is like these two sides, right? Mm -hmm. Of the coin where we can really look at, yeah, there's, you know, time, for example, feeling like out of control or not having choice. Like there's so many ways that we can look at the same theme and see two different sides. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to like some people who are really, again, oftentimes trauma survivors mm -hmm. um, who have been through potentially recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, so I'm also a psychotherapist. So when I talk about trauma, I'm really speaking about it from a clinical perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and when someone's in a traumatic response, their, their defense system is activated, mm -hmm. right? So now that presence of mind, that sort of executive mind function is not online. We're in a primitive right. brain. And there's this way that, you know, we have, most people have only heard of the fight and flight response, but there's actually five different animal defenses, fight, flight, freeze, um, feign death and attach cry. So when we're in a trauma response, sometimes all five of those defense responses are mobilized. Um, but fear is a huge one, right? Mm -hmm. So that freeze response and also the, the fight response is really loud when it comes to fear. Right. And the way the pandemic is, um, you know, being perceived by many people is that it's very frightening, that, you know, it's taking lives, that it's, you know, we, we're not, right. um, we're not prepared. And, and, and the truth is actually when I've done, looked at all of the different, um, you know, gynecological and obstetrics um, societies and like where the rules and regulations are established, um, there's no yet, there's no evidence to say that the coronavirus has any negative impact on uh, fertility outcomes or on mm -hmm. babies right. uh, that are being born, even to COVID positive patients. Mm -hmm. So, so far from the information that I've read, there's no evidence yet that points to like a really negative outcome. Right. Right. So, but there's this real, like when fear comes, it's, it's really, yeah. big. it's like a scary monster. It is. And it's interesting because you hear on the news, like yeah. all the things that could, that are fear death. This is something that mm -hmm. all of humans fear on such a primitive level yeah. death. Your life is at stake. Okay. And then you're hearing, we don't know the unknown. I mean, what else are we more afraid of than the unknown? That's even worse. Like, you know, just cover our eyes and tell us we have no idea where we're walking. We might walk into something or fall down or, you know, that's like the worst fear for humans. So, I mean, that'll, that'll send you to the limbic system, which is the fight or flight or the five levels. I mean, like real fast. Yeah. And so that's, that it's all such an interesting thing because we're kind of faced with our worst fear, like the universe is now giving us our worst possible fear. Yeah. Losing people we love, that's one of our worst fears. I mean, you can't, um, you can't give us more <laughs> than that. And yeah. then on top of it, what's going on with the world and the possible China and this and that. I mean, yeah. And then also losing money, instability, like every single aspect of yeah. fear 
bottled into one. And what else I find interesting about this is that we always have two sides in every single part of our, everything that happens in our life. We always have two sides, but for some reason, those two sides right now in this situation are very clear. Yeah. So that's the beautiful thing about wake up calls. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like you're waking up. <laughs> yeah. Like there's no, you, you can't, you can't put the blinders on. There's no way of like, of trying to shield yourself from this. We're all being thrown in mm -hmm. and, and the shadow is huge right now. Everything that um, we are trying to not look at, mm. a big- It's in our big, face. Yeah, a big magnifying glass is like making it enormous right in front of your face. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't hide from the dark places, the, the fear places, whatever places that have not been, you know, like that, the boxes in the basement mm -hmm. well the stuff is everywhere right now. yeah yeah you gotta so, face it you gotta look at it you gotta smell it you gotta feel it it's right there yeah so i find that that's the biggest challenge for some people who um uh, because sometimes you know you can't again if you have a, a trauma history it's not something that you're you're uh you know, prefrontal cortex can even control. Yeah. Because it, it's the defense system that's been mobilized. So right. in a state like that, you really do have to come back to your tools, right? Of yeah. self-creation, of, of creating calm inside, right. of finding ways to stabilize yourself. Yeah. And, yeah. To, and to pull back from all of that noise mm. because that noise is only going to make that feeling inside worse. Yeah. So there really needs to be, and I mean, that's the beautiful thing about being in isolation. You have this opportunity to go deep inside and be with self and, and, and hold those tender parts that are really having whatever experience, fear or anger or hurt, uh, whatever those experience, loneliness, all of those are valid emotions. And we, Ideally, we want to be skillful. If we're going to be parents, I always say this to my clients, mm -hmm. you're going to have to hold really big emotions for that little person. Yeah, Better such a have, good point. Right? Better to have that skill with self. If you can't hold those big emotions for yourself, but for those inner, inner parts, like child parts, uh, that are, all of us have, you won't be very skillful to hold those big emotions for a little person because they're really big. Yeah. So let's use this time to be skillful and hold those big emotions for ourselves. And as we become more compassionate and kind and, and calming that savage, often uh, savage default mode network that a lot of us operate from, where there's essentially a mean girl in your brain. Right. You such a good, yeah, that's such a good way to say it. And it's, it really is accurate. Yeah. So how do you change that to be a gentle, nurturing, kind, loving, compassionate inner voice? Because ultimately that's the internalized parent that you have. Mm -hmm. So first let's heal that. And then you can be a really wonderful, loving, compassionate, kind, caring, gentle parent, which is ultimately, I think all of us, nobody wants to be a mean parent. Of course. Um, Right? We all want to have children because we want to share love. So let's have that, bring that love to ourselves so that we can be ready to bring that love out to our children. Yeah. And I love that you use the word skill. And the reason being is because it implies empowerment. It implies that you don't have to be a certain type of person mm. to have it. It's something that you choose to get better at and to adopt into your life and that is beautiful because i think that a lot of times that mean girl that you were just talking about inside people's head that mean girl could could convince people that that's not the kind of person they are or they're this kind of person or that kind of person whereas skill is something that 
anybody can have and anybody can choose to put their attention towards building. And that's such a beautiful point, Michelle, because even the mean girl is trying to help you. It's a misguided kind of way. Right. But ultimately through that cruelty and meanness, just like a, a sergeant in the army, ultimately the sergeant in the army who's being mean is has your best interest in mind. It's just in right. a very weird way that that's being communicated. So we have this idea, this notion that a lot of us unfortunately have um, inherited from the way we were parented, mm -hmm. that somehow being really uh, harsh is, is somehow going to change behavior. Unfortunately, right. it doesn't. It actually just reinforces neural feedback networks right. that are really unhealthy and, and don't make us feel good and keep us stuck in shame spirals. Yes. Oh, yeah. So if we can learn to hear that voice and go, oh, wow, so you're really trying to help me in some way. Mm -hmm. right? You really do want my success but that's not the way I want to be talked to. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So teaching in a way you have to have a loving witness inside your brain mm -hmm. uh, to start changing the way the brain, the default mode network, you know, which is wired, unfortunately the way you were raised that oftentimes is unhealthy and, and damaging to the self. And we really do have to create that loving, kind, compassionate self to help, yourself like tame that mean girl because even she's like in a way crying out for help right that's right she's hurting and and it's and that's the thing too why awareness is so beautiful yeah. is because when you do become aware and you do become clear and you can actually see and hear whatever is living inside your head which is why meditation is so powerful is when you start to really pay attention and it really comes down to hurt or at least the perception of feeling broken because okay. we're never broken. That's totally a myth and a belief that we seem to adopt, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, the hurt is real, mm -hmm. um, especially on the fertility journey. And so we really want to hold that heart with gentle care and love so that that healing can happen. Yeah. And when that, that, that child self feels the presence of an adult self, then that's the, the adult can hold that perspective of, you know, uh, big, big picture perspective, but the child right. only feels hurt. That's right. And that's just the way it is. Right. And the child only expresses truth. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's no lying or hiding. It just, it, it's raw. Exactly. It's raw. Yeah. And that's just such an interesting thing that you say about, it's almost like you're learning and, and creating a skill to speak to the child within you. And once you really embrace that challenge that you have, that will create a better mother Absolutely. to an actual child. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. It's an interesting epiphanies. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting how you can take something like this or anything that's really quote unquote bad and create a diamond or a gem. And it, that really, I think that that's the most empowering epiphany that I've had when I was younger, when I've had my own challenges and have learned this because it really, it comes to you in, in any form and face there's many different faces of suffering. Yeah. It's, it could be fertility. It could be anything really. It can be loss. It can be um, unre unreciprocated love, whatever it is that can trigger those same children within us. And so it's a matter of allowing and kind of going through that and seeing it as something that's actually going to make you better or not better because we already are, but we'll at least bring awareness of who we truly are. And so once you realize that challenges can actually do that, I feel like you're, you're ready for anything. You're empowered. Mm -hmm. I feel like you, you become more um, willing to be 
B mold, like B shaped. Uh, there's this, like you talked about that resistance. Mm -hmm. There's less um, holding self away and sort of more willingness to be to be taken because there's a sense of like this is somehow going to be for my best and highest good, right? Mm -hmm. Is that that's willingness to be taken by whatever force is trying to guide you to ultimately where you want to go, right? Because right? because the universe knows where you want to go. The universe knows how to get you there. That's right. Um, and so the willingness to be taken through the path, whatever that path is. That's right. And the same thing happens with the body. And I see it all the time. The body is a self healing machine. It'll self heal. It wants to go that way. Just like the universe wants to heal your life. It's just an intelligence that knows exactly what to do. And it needs only one thing from us. It needs trust and cooperation. That's it. That's all it's asking. And I think that we complicate it, <laughs> which is why it's so hard to get that. Well, like you said, right? It's a, it's a skill. It's mm -hmm. a skill to learn to lean in. And, and it really is that the difference between the yin and the yang, the masculine and the feminine. The masculine is ready to fight. And the feminine is more receptive and, and, and helps us, shows us how to lean in and trust. And very much comes from meditation and and the work of being with self and that quiet mm -hmm. mind. So it is a skill to learn how to move with instead of hold up against. Yeah, for sure. So for people listening now that are obviously in a dark place, I'm sure they've already gotten so much insight from what you've shared. What can you what tool can they rely on or what tool can they use to get them through if they're really, really in a desperate place and they just need something? Hmm. Well, um, I would love to, you know, share that on my website, we have lots of meditations that you can download. Um, I, I've shared um, an ebook that we're currently rewriting uh, to be called the wake up call. Infertility is the wake up call from the divine feminine. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So if that idea resonates for you um, and you want to understand more because surrender is a hard thing mm -hmm. uh, to wrap our heads around. And if anything, we're taught to like try harder, do more, uh, you know, like, find more solutions. We're not taught how to allow ourselves to be guided. Um, and so, like you talked about, that the, the universe is giving us challenges. And if we trust that if we allow ourselves to be challenged, like go through the initiation, that's the way I think of it, Mm -hmm. will come out the other end and it will be good. It'll be okay. Yeah. But that's sort of like the path of the, you know, peaceful warrior. It's sort of that sort of idea. You have to be willing to go on the path, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part. Sometimes right. we're kicking, kicking and screaming. Yeah. So, so my hope through uh, the rewriting of the ebook, which was, which is now called Fertility Secrets of the Female Body. It's really about how to work with the feminine and how to move, be moved through your fertility journey in a way that uh, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to feel like such an awful struggle. That there are things to learn along the way, um, like how to embrace your whole cycle, how to um, reorient your relationship with your menstrual cycle, um, like your period and how you perceive your period and what mm -hmm. it was like your first period so that whole relationship how to heal from losses and trauma um, how to use yoga and meditation as a tool uh, to harmonize hormones and to bring you know optimization to to the way your body is is become is being the vessel um, for for becoming pregnant and also bringing back the joy in baby making, yeah. which is huge. Yeah, so, that's huge. 
<laughs> all of those lessons are are woven in uh and it's only 17 pages so i strongly recommend um that for women who are who want to embrace the feminine that they think about downloading the ebook from my website which is yogagoddess.ca awesome so uh, if people are looking to work with you how can they work with you um you had mentioned your website which i'm going to also include in the episode um the episode notes so um how could people work with you so we have a page actually called work with me uh -huh. <laughs> so there you, you go can, yeah you can check it out uh so fertility yoga and meditation the moon goddess program is predominantly the way that women start working with me Mm -hmm. So that's a self-guided program that you do from home. It's delivered over 12 weeks and you don't have to wait for the yoga program. You get everything at once, but then we send emails weekly to guide you on how to use the program. You have lifetime access. Uh, so like I said, people, women come back for second pregnancies. They come back because of the coronavirus. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons why women come back to their practice sometimes for postpartum, um, and even during pregnancy, it's safe. Uh, so that's the main way. Uh, and then I do private coaching as well, uh, specifically for IVF or specifically if you're trying to conceive naturally. And we have other programs that are uh, more related to your menstrual cycle or your sensuality. So uh, if you look at the work with me page, you'll see all the different options, including womb blessings, which is an energy healing modality. I, I learned love that. from the Gray. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I offer those remotely, especially right now. So that's <laughs> but great. You can come see me in Toronto if you want. Wonderful. So um, always such a joy talking to you. I really, really enjoy our conversations. We're both very esoteric yeah. in nature. So I think that it goes, <laughs> it takes on a life of its own, which I really enjoy and I really love. Thank so you. thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate the invitation and I loved our conversation about the yin and yang. I'm going to keep thinking about that. <laughs> awesome.